<laughs> I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our School of Law for this important symposium on the role of women as general counsel and as senior leaders in the legal profession. I anticipate some lively and thoughtful discussion on the challenges and opportunities facing women in these pivotal roles. I will tell you that when I graduated from the University of Chicago Law School in 1980, women made up just over 8% of the nation's lawyers, according to the Law and Society Review. Today, the American Bar Association tells us that the legal profession is 33% female. Progress has been much slower at the leadership level. The percentage of women who are equity partners at law firms is about 16% today, and just 6% of the nation's 200 largest law firms have women managing partners. Late this summer, the Minority Corporate Counsel Association reported that more women than ever serve as general counsel at Fortune 500 companies, 21%. This is not the progress we hope for. But today is not about what isn't happening. It's about what is happening. The opportunities for professional growth and development within the profession. The challenge for you as lawyers is to determine not just the best way to reach your career aspirations, but also how to mentor up and coming lawyers who will follow in your footsteps. They must see your tracks to know they stand on your shoulders just as we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Women lawyers are now earning just under 87% of what a male lawyer earns. Disheartening to be sure, but when you look back to 2004, women lawyers were earning 73% of the salaries of male counterparts. So we can see real progress occurring, even as the work continues. To the lawyers in the audience, I'm pleased that you joined us for this really important discussion. And I hope today's program enhances your professional development. To the law students who will be joining you, and if a couple of them are here now, you have the opportunity to learn from some truly remarkable women. To our speakers, thank you for joining us today to share your insights, your wisdom, your experiences. And I am, of course, especially grateful to Anne Harlan for her leadership and for being the catalyst for today's program. Later today, you're going to meet Case Western Reserve's general counsel, Libby Kiefer, who will be joining you for an afternoon session and I hope you enjoy hearing from her as well. Now I am pleased to turn the program over to Lawrence Mitchell, Dean of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the Joseph C. Hostetler Baker and Hostetler Professor of Law. Thank you all. Thank you, President Snyder. You are, of course, a personification of this conference and your presence here underscores how important this law school and these issues are to the life and health of our university. Before we begin, I, begin, I have many people to thank for making this conference possible. First are the conference co-chairs, Anne Harlan, Colleen Batchelor, Laura Quotella, and Christine Wellman, for their hard work and the outstanding job they did in putting this conference together. I'd particularly like to single out Anne for her extraordinary efforts as quarterback when she and I first discussed this idea within days of my becoming dean, I just couldn't have imagined what she could do. Thanks also to our six sponsoring law firms, Elmer and Byrne, Baker Hostetler, Calfee, Jones Day, Squire Sanders, Tucker Ellis, and Thompson Hine. Associate deans J.T. Garibrand, Jesse Hill, and Sarah Polly, and staff assistant Jessica McRitchie were instrumental to our success. Our Women's Law Association members who are introducing the various moderators during the day are Diana Feitel, Cassandra Tice, Maria Hibbard, and Rebecca Sramak. Thank you to all of you who are speaking today and to all of you who have taken the time to attend. Your presence shows real engagement and underscores the importance of these issues. Finally, none of this would have been possible without the tireless dedication and energy of our extraordinary center, director of academic centers, Nancy Pratt. This year is historically significant for our law school. For the third time in 25 years, which effectively means in the history of the law school, only 50% of our entering class is male. As pleased as I am that we achieved this goal, 
It's kind of sobering to realize that our achievements are really quite modest. This is no surprise to many of you, and I suspect especially to our speakers and panelists today. When they began their careers, and even as they rose to the top in their various businesses and law firms, their opportunities to rise were hardly assured. I attended law school within living memory, <laughs> and my Columbia class of 1981 consisted of no more than 25% women, a couple of an improvement on, on the general population, but not really good. When I started on Wall Street, most firms had one woman partner, if at all, and more often than not, she was working in the trusts and estates department, doing what generally was known on the street as women's work, not doing deals, not trying cases. When a partner took you to lunch at his club, and you had to have more self-confidence than I did to refuse to go, we had to take the ladies' entrance and the ladies' elevator whenever a woman was present. And in most cases, we had to use the ladies' dining room. Even in academia, a well-known bastion of liberalism and openness, when I entered in 1987, women were a tiny fraction of every faculty and remain substantially minorities today. Ours, I regret to say, is no exception. The point requires no further elaboration. I have been only a reasonably sensitive observer. Many of you here today lived it, and often worse. But I make the point anyway, for to do so underscores the extraordinary talent, humility, and perseverance that has led to so much remarkable success for women in America over these last 40 years. The speakers today hold positions of leadership. But it took all of those qualities of leadership and more for them to struggle to achieve their current offices. Now, when I think of what the paths of women over these decades, it strikes me that women in America very much resemble a class of immigrants. Internal immigrants, true, but immigrants nonetheless. The United States has, throughout its history, continually been renewed by successive groups of immigrants, just as our innovation, our economic advancement, our creativity and prosperity and competitiveness have bloomed and flourished with the introduction into our social and economic life, new ways of seeing the world, with the fresh perspectives of new cultures, with the re-energizing of fading domestic work ethics born of abundance and prosperity being fueled by the vigorous competition created by the determination and ambition of these new workers, so has the release of the talents, perspectives, and drive of women profoundly affected our law, business, society, and culture. Looking back from my early years of practice through these past decades, it also seems to me that the evolution of women in government, commerce, and leadership tracks the historical path of immigrants. Women in the 1960s and 70s, not to mention before, faced overt and unchallenged discrimination, were treated offhandedly and quite often quite offensively by their male colleagues, no matter how good they were. And they were often discouraged or stopped in the advancement of their careers. Each later generation of women found the path just a little easier, until now when reasonably broad assimilation has occurred. Matters, of, of course, are far from perfect. Nothing ever is. I, I myself still, still hear in person the occasional anti-Semitic comment, and other groups face much worse. But it is undeniable that this new immigrant class of women has widely assimilated in, to all reaches of our economic, cultural, civic, and social lives. The result has been transformative for all of us. Today's speakers help make this happen. Yet there is so much work to be done, as the data President Snyder reported show. That is why I today announce the creation of the Women's Law and Leadership Initiative at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law. We are currently putting together a board of advisors and beginning the process of fundraising, and we welcome all the help we can get. Over the coming months, I will be working with the faculty to make this initiative a permanent center within the law school continue to continue the work we begin today. We already are planning our conference for next year. It is time that our law school assumed leadership in studying the range of issues we know exist and others we will find. On a personal note, I'd like to say, 
that whatever I may have accomplished in my year of deanship, there is nothing of which I am prouder than this. Now, why here at Case Western Reserve? During the course of my interviews for this deanship and in the weeks succeeding my appointment, it struck me that every alumna I met seemed to be at or near the top of her law firm, corporation, or public interest organization, or held significant positions in government or the judiciary. A bit of research into our alumni body confirmed that this was no coincidence. We educate leaders. Our women are no exception. It seemed to me that we ought to do something with all this talent and achievement. I discussed the idea with Anne, a great friend, a great person, and a great, great asset to the law school, whom I met early on, and with my Associate Dean for Development and Public Affairs, J.T. Garibrand, who is no slouch herself. They liked the idea of this initiative and recommended that the first step be an inaugural conference, the conference we hold today. Following Margaret Thatcher's sage advice that if you want something done, ask a woman, I asked Anne to spearhead the effort. What Anne and her colleagues have accomplished far exceeds my or any reasonable expectation. I can see no better way to launch our center than what we are doing today. I hope all of you will find a way to participate. Thank you. Now, it is my honor to introduce Laura Quotella, class of 82, a truly exceptional leader. Laura was elected president of Eastman Kodak on January 1, 2012. Any of you who are sentient will understand that this wasn't necessarily a plum assignment. <laughs> um, Needless to say, Laura has assumed her responsibilities at a rather challenging time for Kodak. The word iconic is so overused these days, but Eastman Kodak is truly an iconic company in the United States, even, even immortalized in song. Um, the confidence shown in Laura by her board of directors is ample proof of her extraordinary leadership, her vision, her discipline, and her legal and managerial skills. Prior to her election as president, Laura served Eastman Kodak as general counsel and senior vice president. Laura joined Kodak in 1999, kind of near the bottom, um, and held a number of different positions in the company's legal department on her way to the top. As Kodak regains its health and stature, much of its success will be due to Laura's leadership. Before she joined Kodak, Laura worked for several other corporations and was in private practice as a defense litigator specializing in mass tort cases. I think it's obvious that Laura Quotella is a role model for all of us. Thank you so much, Laura, for your efforts to make this conference possible and for being here with us today. With that, I turn the podium over to you. Thank you enough, Dean Mitchell, for your kind remarks, and President Snyder uh, for her support of this wonderful event, which I'm thrilled to be associated with. And I couldn't be prouder to be part of a law school that will undertake the initiative that Dean Mitchell just announced. When I was here last year at his invitation to speak about IP monetization, and I, the dean had just started in his position, um, and I was just meeting him. He came bounding towards me and said, do you know how many female general counsels this law school has graduated? And then I quickly met Anne, and clearly she shared the same passion um, around this subject matter. Oh, I'm going to go back to the title. There we go. Um, uh, so in just a short year, I can hardly believe that this initiative has been conceived, planned, and now implemented, and I congratulate you, and I congratulate Anne on that wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you so much from all of us. And I hope that this forum will become a permanent part of uh, that center, because I think the uh, registration for this event has been uh, terrific. Um, last night at the networking meeting, I had the opportunity to meet a number of you, and I'm just thrilled at the diverse audience that we've uh, attracted to the event. 
Uh, there was a similar event in New York City a few weeks ago, I mentioned this to some people last night, that was sponsored by the New York Bar, and I noticed um, with a little concern that the title was almost identical. And I had hoped to attend so that I could pick up some pointers for this conference. I wasn't able to attend, but a friend of mine did, and there were only 12 registrants. So I'm sorry for the New York Bar for that, um, but I'm very pleased the case has actually been able to generate such a rousing crowd. So thank you for taking time from your days and your practices to be here. Um, and I hope that we can attract more men to the conference in the future, and I thank those men who have taken the, who are courageous enough to attend. Um, so thanks. Yes, I was, uh, I did transition from general counsel to president and chief operating officer of the company. We've since lost the C titles to bankruptcy. Um, and 19 days later, we filed. Um, so I'm able to say, I don't know who created that mess. I wasn't around. Um, <laughs> it's been, a, it's been a, a, an incredible ride. Uh, one of our speakers later today, uh, David Kurtz, has been uh, my partner in bankruptcy. He is the uh, head of the restructuring practice at Lazard. Lazard is our restructuring banker. And so it's from him I've learned what little I do know about bankruptcy. I hope not to learn too much. Um, but he's an extraordinary individual and was very, very kind to agree to come here. David has reached the top of the investment banking profession, um, and he really is a remarkable human being. So you'll get to hear from him later. Uh, I don't typically use prepared remarks, and I apologize for doing so today. But when I saw the amount of time allotted to this keynote address on the agenda, I decided I better write some things down. So forgive me as I glance at my notes. It hadn't occurred to me until I, until I started thinking about what I might talk with you about today that I actually left Gund Hall 30 years ago, which is a little frightening. Um, 1982, 1982. We graduated in our class a number of luminaries, me not included. Um, the, the one that I think most often of, um, and who really was a leader back then, uh, is uh, uh, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Kate O'Malley. Um, Kate always sat in the front row, and she always had the answer, and we all knew it. Um, so she's very, she's very well placed, and as you know, she's had a brilliant judicial career. So I, I wasn't in her ranks, but I'm very, very proud that uh, she came from our class. In fact, the, the most vivid memory I have of the months following graduation is uh, walking down the street on the afternoon that we completed the bar exam in Chicago. Um, a group of us from my class were walking along, and one of, uh, all of us had jobs of one kind or another in Chicago, and one of uh, my peers said to the, to the group, so we've been doing this for about a month now, we've just taken the bar exam, w w have any of you figured out what it means to be a lawyer? Do you know what you're doing? Wh why are we doing this? Are we going to be contributing anything? And uh, I have to say, he was a jokester. In fact, he left law school at some point briefly to follow the Grateful Dead on, on tour. <laughs> but, but he came back. Um, I actually, I have to say, I also lost my locker partner after several weeks in my first year of law school. He just disappeared, and we couldn't figure out where he'd gone. And it turns out that he was um, on the U.S. luge team, and they'd made the Olympic cut, so off he went. He didn't come back. It was a colorful class. Um, in any event, uh, so, so this guy was a bit of a jokester, and he was... He was being funny, but frankly, we all stopped dead at our tracks at the questions because we stood there and we thought about them and none of us really had a satisfactory answer to any of them. And we realized that we had student loans and one of us had a family with children and we had lots of people who had high expectations of us and we didn't have a clue what we were doing or where we were going or what this profession was all about. So it was a daunting moment. I've never forgotten it. I, I think back so often and, and try to remember what I thought the answers were, where I thought I was headed in this profession. I never, would have, I never would have charted the course of my mind that I guess I followed. It felt at that point for all the world like the joke was on us. Um, but in fact, everybody in that group remained gainfully employed and, um, and ha have excelled in, their, in this profession. So I guess we did okay. Walking down Randolph Street in Chicago in those early 80s, I also never would have predicted that anybody would think of me as a strategic partner to anybody or anything. Um, so I go back to my friend Mike's line of questioning, and I think the, one of the reasons we're here today is to explore the questions, what does it mean to be a strategic partner? How does one become a strategic partner? Do we really want to be a strategic partner? Is it, worthwhile, is it a worthwhile endeavor? 
So I hope that at the conclusion of this Case Western Reserve University School of Law inaugural Women in Law Leadership Conference, um, after you've heard from all the speakers today and you've had a, a chance to participate, I hope very vigorously in discussions, you'll all be answering the question, yes, I do want to be a strategic partner. I understand what it means and I want to go forward with that goal in mind. So I think um, hopefully that's the focus of this year's conference and, and hopefully you all come away feeling that you have gained something from it. So let's begin with the fundamentals. What strategy? Early in my career, as Dean Mitchell mentioned, I was a defense uh, litigator and I was an associate in a practice that specialized in mass tort litigation. Um, I eventually went on to a, a second firm that, ha that had that specialty. Um, but the biggest, the biggest case I worked on was the 125 death cases that were filed following the crash of Pan Am Flight 759 into the neighborhood of Kenner, Louisiana. And of course, in any trial situation, it's the job of the trial team to save the client from liability if you're a defense lawyer, and that was our job. Um, the question of that case was, it was so complex. There were so many moving parts. Everything was interrelated. How were we gonna get from point A to point uh, Z um, with, our client, with our client's goals achieved? And it required the development of strategy. Um, the, the goal was not to avoid payments to the victim's families, but to limit the payments by Pan Am, the client, to the families. And so that was the strategic objective that we were serving. Early after the case, after the investigation, aviation experts felt that causation stemmed from wind shear. It was one of the first wind shear cases in the aviation litigation. And it was the result of the air traffic controller's failure to give uh, accurate wind shear uh, uh, descriptions to the pilot, the readings to the pilot. As you can imagine, the FAA, couldn't, the FAA couldn't be sued. So a key element of the case for us became convincing the government to make a meaningful contribution to a settlement fund. Um, remember that I described the goal not to avoid payments to victims' families, but to avoid Pan Am's exposure to the families. And so developing a contribution fund was extremely important to all of us. So we devised a strategy of expanding rather than contracting the funds available to plaintiffs. In other aspects of the litigation, our uh, tactics were not quite as aligned with the victim's family's interests, and I'm not proud of a number of things that we had to do on behalf of the client. Um, I'll come back to this topic of, of tactics in a little bit. But the strategy actually worked. The government did contribute to, met rather massively to a fund for plaintiffs, and Pan Am consequently uh, was able to pay for less than it uh, had initially expected in the case. So that was really my first exposure to strategy, of developing a plan to advance a goal and then lining up tactics in order to implement the plan. Um, and I didn't really think too hard about it at the time, but it was a wonderful lesson in how to deploy strategy. 20 years later, um, I left litigation and I had moved in-house. Uh, I worked for two other companies before I joined Kodak. But 20 years later, I was at Kodak, and the company at that time was looking to gain share in the digital camera market. After virtually every other consumer electronics company in the world had introduced a camera. <laughs> so it was an interesting time. Um, why we were so late to the market uh, when Kodak had actually invented the digital camera in 2000, or in 1975. It's a story that I told when Dean Mitchell kindly invited me last year to speak about IP strategy. This laptop's in my way. Um, so I won't go into that. But we did, we, we were where we were, and we needed to devise a strategy for succeeding in a very, very crowded market. The CEO had brought in a fellow named Willie Shee. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, not remembering right now where Willie came from, but he had run, he was running, uh, Strategy Analytics, I think, was running another company. And, and Willie was tasked to run the digital camera business, and it was from him that I really learned, really learned about strategy. One of his first acts, coming into a very conservative company, was to divide the entire workforce of the digital camera business up into teams. Um, there was a team, each team represented a competitor in the digital camera market. There was a team for Sony and for Nikon and for Casio and you know, on and on. And for six weeks, 
Willie carefully conducted uh, what he called competitive warfare, which was an exercise pitting each team against the others over product feature sets, supplier capacity, sales volumes, pricing, distribution channels, and so on. In this way, Willie emulated and assessed the market conditions surrounding Kodak's entry into the camera business, and he devised, along with his team, a tactical plan for dealing with each competitor. For instance, what functionality our products would have to, have to feature in order to woo customers away from the cameras that were currently in their closets, um, which suppliers should be brought in to, on board to order, in order to limit other players' capacity, whether to sell products in Japan, where many competitors enjoyed a hometown advantage. At least these were the moves that we could see him making with the teams that he had tasked. When the exercise was complete, Willie gave me a copy of The Art of War. I'd begun to read this book in the late 80s when it topped business executives' bestseller list, but I didn't appreciate its significance then. Willie encouraged me to digest the book before coming back to, the, to him to discuss competitive warfare. How, how many of you have read the book, The Art of War? A little bit? Yeah, so some of you. For those of you ha who haven't read it, I characterize it as the Taoist Bible of warfare and military strategy. Sun Tzu <coughs> is thought to have written it during Chinese, China's Warring States period, about 2,500 years ago, although this is very much in debate, actually where the book came from and who authored it and why it was written. But the content of the book, which is a fairly simple and straightforward uh, thing to read, is organized in 13 chapters. And taken together, those chapters espouse a philosophy of military conflicts, managing them, and winning battles. Essentially, Sun Tzu teaches a strategy of deception. On the one hand, he urges us to learn our enemy's instincts intimately and to study his tactics to the point of complete and total understanding. On the other hand, Sun Tzu counsels us to practice the art of deception and to delude the adversaries with our behaviors. He's, he, he counsels when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear in, inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make the enemy believe we are near. So by adopting these methods, according to Sunger, we will gain strategic advantage. When Willie and I next discussed competitive warfare, he explained that the first objective of the exercise was what it seemed. It was to immerse the business teams in a study of their digital camera competitors and to enable a deep understanding of their product offerings and how they were approaching the market through their tactics. Though we could capably market a product with more megapixels and user-friendly features than other camera makers, we wouldn't be able to, to sustain this differentiation because competitors would quickly copy our improvements. The fact was that we were late in coming to market, as I said, and the captured technologies that Kodak had heavily invested in developing had become ubiquitous in other products. So Willie had determined that the battle needed to be fought in different terms. He and his business team devised the commercial, commercialization plan for selling cameras at prevailing margins. And for a decade, we held number one, two, or three market share in every country around the globe. Our tactics were sound, but as Willie anticipated, the various players' product offerings were virtually indistinguishable, and product margins were razor thin. And that, that only became truer as the years wore on. Whoops. So as I share in the slide, we could see the tactics. We couldn't imagine what was the strategy until we better understood how, how Willie was thinking of the market. His strategy was to level the playing field, as he referred to it. Remember that I said we'd invented the digital camera, and every competitor was freely using our technology. He determined the time had come for them to reimburse Kodak for our R&D investment. And he pulled together a virtual team of technologists, MBAs, lawyers, and other, uh, and other experts and professionals and launched Kodak's digital camera licensing program. Today we read about the IP wars and battles among the telecoms on the front page of the newspaper. But in 2003, uh, IP licensing was not a spectator sport. And if it was done at all, it was done very quietly behind closed doors and it was done at fairly low uh, royalty rates. 
How that licensing program at Kodak evolved was, again, the subject of my last presentation at the law school. It is um, my proudest accomplishment in a strategic context because we took this nascent cross-functional virtual team of people who were just learning how to do this sort of thing, many of whom did not have IP backgrounds. And within a few years, we developed um, a multi-billion dollar business. In five years hence, we were bringing in almost a billion dollars a year to the company. And over the time of the program, we generated between three and four billion dollars. Willie's business was able to record these revenues, at, or these royalties as revenue, and so his profit margins increased considerably. And Kodak became the most profitable camera maker in the industry. So it was a, another incredible example for me of how to devise and deploy a strategy to great advantage to an enterprise. Um, some people say that Sunjur did not say this, so some charlatan, I guess, um, pronounced the quotation, but, but it's one that I think is very, very apt. Strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. It's absolutely true. No translation of the, of the book includes this quotation, but it's often attributed to Sunjur. Whomever expressed the sentiment first, I think it properly describes the relative importance of strategy and tactics. Optimally in any situation, both are fully developed. But short of that, with strategy intact, one will ultimately reach his or her goal. An example of Kodak's digital camera business, we could have deployed the level of the playing field strategy and engaged in licensing only without selling cameras, but by developing a product line, we were able to gain access to the upper echelons of management in companies where we needed to extract large royalties um, through complex negotiations. So we got access to competitor senior decision makers um, who had to approve the very sizable royalty payments that we were asking for. Conversely, if we'd merely developed a tactical plan for participating in the market, our profit margins would have disappointed and we would have had to carry the sizable cost of our, the R&D investment that our competitors had never, um, had never made. I should mention that as a postscript to this story, Willie Shi is now at the Harvard Business School teaching, among other things, business strategy. <laughs> and I understand that his classes are among the best attended in the school. As I've put into, the pra into practice the lessons that he and the art of war have taught me, I think I've nurtured probably uh, what was a strategic instinct um, into somewhat of a skill set. And that skill set informs the way I approach virtually any business situation that I confront. I see, I think David Kurtz just walked in somewhere, and he missed all my shining compliments. Um, interestingly, in the business world, people are often labeled as strategic or tactical, or in business terms, often you hear people spoken of as operational. Different jobs are thought to require one or the other skill set. The CEO is looked to be is looked at to be the keeper of strategy. The chief operating officer is, is expected to work out the necessary tactical plans to achieve the CEO strategy. <clears throat> to my observation, whatever the whenever the strategy label is added to someone's title, they're anointed with some sort of a mystical aura. <laughs> and in all the career development discussions that I've had over time with employees, I think the most frequently asked questions are, can I have strategy in my title? And uh, <laughs> Seriously, and is that job going to involve st uh, strategic responsibility? So it's, it's a coveted experience, this, this strategy setting, and uh, it's kind of interesting how people think about it. If somebody is called operational in a company, in my mind, I immediately leap to the image of someone who is a master planner, somebody who can always figure out the steps for getting from point A to point B. Not thinking up the plan, but attending to the details. Um, that are required to implement a plan that somebody else dreams up. Let's take a quick survey. By a show of hands, how many of you consider yourselves to be strategic? Very, very interesting. And same question on tactics. Are you tactical or operational? The dean is, the dean is taking leadership here. How many of you consider yourselves to be both? There we go, there we go. 
very interesting, very interesting. In my experience, it's truly the exceptional talent that combines both strategic acumen and tactical discipline. Winston Churchill comes to mind. I was just in the, in the, um, the Churchill Museum in London with my daughter, and I was just fascinated by the way he could de devise a strategy and deploy a strategy with, of course, military-like precision. Just an incredible, incredible man. Steve Jobs is another example of someone that all of us would probably think of as being both tactical and operational. But we think about others in the public eye. I mean, how would you characterize Barack Obama? I've really had to think about that one. How about Mitt Rod Romney? It's kind of interesting. Hillary Clinton. Bill Clinton. So as you think through people in the public eye, it's interesting to think about them from that perspective. Are they really visionaries? Are they planners? Are they coming up with the ideas? Or are they merely implementing somebody else's ideas? Which there's a lot to be said for, so I don't mean to suggest that tactical uh, career is less um, honorable than a strategic one. I think I've managed to fool our human resources team into believing that my left side, the left side of my brain and the right side of my brain both fire on equal cylinders, but psychological profiling that I've been subjected to in my career confirms otherwise. I am very much a strategic thinker. I am not a tactician. And so I've had to learn over my career to um, immerse myself in work teams where Others have the tactical talent. And I, I, I've become actually very uh, directive about that. And so whenever I'll talk a little bit about um, setting up teams, whenever I pull a team together to work on a project, I make sure that I understand the proclivities of the team members and that I've balanced sort of the strategic view with the tactical view, or the operational view. So this approach, combine, combining a very strong team of, of operationally focused resources and, and, and strategic res resources has really enabled me and my career and us at Kodak in uh, the area that I work to, to consistently deliver on our objectives. It's really important. So I'd suggest, about, I'd suggest having self-awareness about your own profile. It's a critical step in career development and in career advancement. Understand your strengths and augment them with other talents that you don't possess. None of us is everything. None of us can manage the whole show. So having the right people around you is very, very, very important. So now I'd like to lay some groundwork um, to take us to the next point, which is perhaps controversial. The point is that firms with significant numbers of top female managers excel, both in terms of organizational aspects, such as innovation and accountability, but also in terms of profit. Let's see hands again. How many of you believe the statement is true? Then I, my job is done. <laughs> Let's look at the background data. There's an ever, ever growing body of research in this area. You heard President Snyder tick off some of the statistics that um, have come to the public eye. Um, this research is being conducted globally. Uh, in preparation for being with you today, I looked at studies in India, in Vietnam, many studies in Europe, lots of studies in the US. Europe actually has led the way in this research, but the US is catching up quickly. I, uh, you know, running a bankrupt company, I haven't had a lot of time to immerse myself in research, um, but if you, if you have the time to, to go online and look at some of the studies that are being conducted, they're really rather remarkable. It's a fascinating, fascinating area. Um, for the past couple of years, though, I have tried to follow two uh, particular reports. The first is a study by Catalyst, and it's titled Linking Performance and Gender Balance on the Board. Um, it's a study that was done several years ago, but Catalyst continues to update it and to expand the research around it. The other is um, the Women Matter series of reports um, put out by the consulting firm McKinsey and Company. Um, McKinsey started these reports in 2006, and they've produced, I think, five of them. The latest of these was issued this year, and it's titled Making the Breakthrough. And a, a lot of what I'm going to show you rely, relies very heavily on these reports. To get the lay of the land, let's first see where women are showing up in the top ranks on company executive committees and board of directors. If you live in a law firm environment, think of a, of a corporate executive committee as the management committee. In-house, it's typically comprised of the C-suite, as they say, CEO, COO, CTO, CIO, perhaps, um, sometimes the chief IP officer. 
um, as well as the business unit heads, and if businesses and regions are managed separately within a company, then the heads of the regions as well. That's typically the composition of a corporate executive committee. This is where the course is charted. It's in the room where the executive committee of a, of a company meets, that the strategy is set. And in the corporate environment, of course, the strategic recommendations from the executive committee, which are approved by the CEO, are then turned into recommendations to the board and the board ultimately approves those strategic initiatives. I've been a member of Kodak's executive committee for the past six years. Uh, first in my role as chief IP officer, because we were generating so much money, so much, such a significant portion of the company's revenue, it was determined that IP needed a voice at the table. Um, and that was important. It was an important um, support uh, mechanism for the IP initiative of the company. It's one of the reasons that we were successful. Um, I, then, uh, I then transitioned to the general counsel role, which was a standing member of the committee. Um, and then in uh, early, earlier this year, I uh, changed roles again. And of course, the COO title entitled me to continue to attend meetings. Um, and we've, as I said, we've uh, dispensed with those titles um, as part of our planning for emergence, um, to, which will be filed with the bankruptcy court. Surely, I'm proud to say. Um, but the executive committee continu continues intact and will continue um, its membership through emergence. And it has really helped to chart the course of the bankruptcy for the company. So that is where it happens, inside those meetings. Um, women's representation on executive committees and corporate boards is um, something that's being very, very closely tracked, as President Snyder mentioned. Um, she was talking about law firms. I'm showing you data that pertains to companies. <coughs> And um, most of the data that I'll share with you comes from the European research. Many of the charts that I'll show you I've lifted from the McKinsey report, so I apologize to McKinsey. I believe it's fair use. Um, <laughs> and a pot better be. And apologies to, use, to you for the, for the quality of the reproductions. It's a little eye straining, so I'm sorry about that. But th these charts are really eye opening, um, if you can see them. If you're interested in the topic, as I said, I commend the reports to you. You can find them very, very easily online, and they're well worth the, the time to, uh, it takes to read through them. As I said, there are five in the series. They were published between 2006, I believe, and um, the latest one was published earlier this year. Uh, one more note on the charts before we get into the data. Um, again, you'll see that most of it derives from European companies. The body of research covering U.S. companies is exploding. And except with respect to the Fortune 100 companies, it's fairly consistent with what we're seeing in Europe. For their part, though, the Fortune 100 are taking action with really greater gusto than their European counterparts um, to advance women to senior management positions. So that's one area that's a real bright spot in the United States. In fact, the top, Fortune, the top 10 Fortune 100 companies average almost 34% female representations on their executive committees. And you'll see that that stands in stark contrast to what's going on in Europe. From left to right, this first chart shows the percentage of executive committee membership comprised of women in 2011 in companies listed on the main indices uh, in a range of European countries. In the case of each country, the growth in percentage female membership since 2007 is the next column. And then the same metrics for corporate board representation is on the right of the chart. So executive committees on the left, uh, corporate boards on the right. Between 2007 and 2011, legally binding quotas were introduced in Belgium, France, Italy, and Norway, requiring female board representation. Non-binding quotas were adopted by most of the other countries on this list. So you would think of these as places where the opportunity for women to be attracted to boards, those binders full of women, um, would be uh, <laughs> you know, would they, women would be hotly pursued for these roles. Um, this is one of the factors that contributes to the five-point increase over the period in the average uh, percentage of board seats held by women. If you subscribe to the notion that women leaders contribute to organization performance, then this trend is pretty good news. The bad news, though, is that female representation on the executive committees of these companies is far lower than on the boards. Although female participation has increased by four points over the period covered by the chart, it still stands at only 10% of executive committee roles in the nine countries. Worse, the barely perceptible annual growth rate means that 
there won't even be 20% representation in the year 2022. Just can't keep up. This chart depicts the female representation at different levels of organizations in various sectors, starting on the left with media, telecom, and tech, then financial services, consumer goods, next is transport, logistics, and tourism, and finally on the right, energy and materials. You see the same percentage of women holding executive committee seats as we just discussed pretty much across the sectors. What's interesting here, though, is the pipeline into the senior executive level. At Kodak, we call it the feeder pool, which is a little harsh, but that's what we've always called it, the feeder pool. Um, whole HR programs are built around the feeder pool. McKinsey's research shows that although many companies have stepped up recruitment of women, women become increasingly underrepresented as they ascend to organizational levels. You can see, for example, that almost half of all financial services employees are women, but the representation shrinks by more than half the management level. Greater advancement opportunities are actually found in sectors having fewer females overall, which is kind of ironic, such as transport in the penultimate column and energy and materials in the last column, where women have a relatively good chance of promotion to mid-manager and beyond. They hold 11% of the seats on exec committees, the same as the consumer goods sector, despite having proportionally fewer women in the organizations. And while David's out of the room, I'm going to tell a story which you can't repeat. Um, I've been working in this bankruptcy pro on this bankruptcy project for um, close to a year. And uh, one thing that one gains in bankruptcy is just a heck of a lot of advisors. I never would have dreamed that there were so many, one needed so many people to get through bankruptcy. I am in front of or with groups of people day in and day out, presenting the emergence plan, presenting the business's performance, talking about the strategy of getting in and getting out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yesterday morning, I came before one of these groups, sorry, and I noticed for the first time a woman in the room. And she very timidly came up to me after the meeting and said, I was told to introduce myself to you. I'm at Lazard, and I'm a lawyer like you are. <laughs> and I said, why are you the first woman I've seen in the past 12 months? And she said, well, there aren't many of us in the restructuring practice. Well, why is that? Well, to be in the restructuring practice, you really have to have a working knowledge of finance. And at entry level, there aren't a lot of women on Wall Street who combine those skills. So I'm going to talk a lot more about that, but that was her perception of why she sort of stands alone. And I have to say, I feel like I'm where I started 30 years ago when I'm with my bankruptcy colleagues. And where are the women in these groups? Anyway, so don't tell them. Don't tell them I mentioned any of this because I promised them I wouldn't go down this path. <laughs> So we won't talk about this on our panel later, later today. Um, so let's look at, so I have it right. yeah, okay, this chart averages the female participation percentages at various levels that we just looked at, so it combines them. But in addition, it demonstrates the odds of advancement from tier to tier for men over women. You see that the odds are consistently stacked against women from management entry level on up. And just look at that number at the top. Women are, men are five times more likely to, accede, to ascend to the CEO role than women. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. There are three female CEO, CEOs in the Fortune 100 in the United States. Three. 100. Do the math. Yet McKinsey's reports, Catalyst study, and other analyses conducted around the globe point to a clear and significant correlation between women in leadership and stronger financial returns. Here's Catalyst's picture of the better bottom line. This is astounding. When I saw this, I thought, I must be reading this wrong or somebody made this up. These charts track the significant performance advantages of Fortune 500 companies having three or more women on the board. In terms of return on equity, return on sales, and return on investment, invested capital. And let me just call out the statistics. Companies having more female board members show a 42% higher return on sales, a 53% higher return on equity, and a 112% higher return on invested capital than those with the fewest number of women in the company or on the board. It is true, it is true that propelling women to the top is a performance driver. 
So before we leave the data, let me just cite one more provocative tidbit that was covered recently in Harvard Business Review's regular Idea Watch column. If you read the review, you see this um, little corner column quite often. A study conducted and then twice replicated in the last year by MIT and Carnegie Mellon professors found that there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. Very little correlation. But a group that includes more women, in a group that includes more women, its collective intelligence rises remarkably. I have a really close friend who some of you may know named Bill Lee. Um, I hope to bring him next year, so Anne, I think we've talked about him, uh, to next year's conference. And um, we, Anne and I had talked about a couple topics that he would be really, really brilliant um, in lecturing on. Um, until recently, Bill uh, co-managed the law firm Wilmer Hale. Prior to the merger, Bill was the managing partner of Wilmer Cutler in Boston. He continues to be the chair of Wilmer Hale's IP litigation practice, and he is probably the premier IP litigator in the world. Um, he somehow finds time to teach uh, an entry-level course, an L1-level course at Harvard Law School. And he, now t he, um, he begins the semester, every, every semester he begins, with an exercise that he had used very many times at the law firm prior to starting teaching. He asks students to answer a range of questions. You know, what's the circumference of the earth? How many symphonies did Beethoven write? You know, that sort of what's a Google? Those sorts of things, the things you find on the, on the mobile phone. What's the most Googled question of the day? Um, and uh, then he teaches a series of lessons on leadership through the course of the semester. Before he returns the individual test scores, he randomly counts the students off into groups and directs each to select a leader using the lessons that they've learned over, over the weeks preceding. Now he administers the same quiz again, but this time on a group basis. He also asks the leaders to rate their confidence level in the group's performance. Every single time Bill has run this exercise, whether in the law firm environment or at the law school, the results have been exactly the same. And I'm sorry, men, because you're gonna think I'm bashing you, but the highest individual quiz score is achieved by a woman, the highest group score is turned in by a group with a female leader, and the male leader's confidence level far exceeds the female leader's. <laughs> I'll come back to Bill and his initiatives a little later. Think about that. So what is it about women? What is it about us that drives our effectiveness when we're given a chance to take part in strategy setting? A little while ago, you self-identified. Some of you labeled yourselves as naturally strategic. Others said you were more naturally tactical. I'd like to hear now from you. This is your turn to talk. I'd like to hear from the strategics what you think you bring to the table. I'd like to hear from the tacticals what you observe strategics bring into any discussion or project or work environment. So let me have some volunteers. Strategics. What talents, what assets, what skill sets, what ways of thinking help you achieve your goals? Thanks, Anne. needs to support the plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Who else? Yes. Hi, Liz. Oh, Liz. Oh, I'm going to have to give you a hug after us. How are you? Liz and I grew up together. Not only attended law school together. It's so good to see you. So anyway, I say as a more tactical person that strategics have an ability to kind of think in a trite place that outside the box, to kind of abandon what the current sort of assumptions are about Absolutely, absolutely. Good point. It's good to see you. Who else? Yes. Um, taking the big picture and distilling it into two or three key themes to pursue with specific tactics. Right. Seeing a way through the through the forest. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I think that strategics have an ability to sense risk. Mm -hmm. and oh, interesting. To sense risk. A neat instinct for that. And do what with it? And then. Uh, sense the risk and really what Anne was saying after that, the 
able to sense the risk and see, be, see around the corner mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. be able to uh, take a look at where you're going to need to go, what the problem is going to be that you need to solve. That's a really important point, and it's interesting that you raise it because you'll see that um, from people who are studying in Syria, that's a pretty key, pretty key talent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see that in your M&A practice, I'm sure, frequently, right? Yes? I think making connections with the spirit, information, data, mm -hmm. and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just assemble that and listen. That's well said. Yeah, that's well said. Absolutely. Who else? Yes? I think strategic has the big picture and the kind of maybe sometimes pie in the sky about what they want to do, whereas the tacticals kind of make that happen. So my family has a family business and one of the members of the family always says, you know, I want to build a colony on the sun and, you know, how can we make that happen? And everyone rolls their eyes and says that's impossible. Or if tacticals look at, and we have other tacticals in our family who say, all right, how are we going to do that? Like, what are the factors? So even if it's kind of really high in the sky, these are some tacticals that are, all right, how can we So who wins? Um, Most often. Compromise and we don't end up building a colony in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever built a colony in the sun? No, but these are the discussions where we use those as examples to parallel, you know, ideas that are brought to the table so we can get less um, passionate about the specific topic and kind of take a hypothetical to follow the approach. Sure. I think family businesses are fascinating, and they're fascinating from this perspective. I married into a family business, thank goodness my husband doesn't participate in it, so we're on the sidelines watching the battles all the time, and it's, I mean, it's great dinner entertainment, it's incredible. Who else? That's all good points, yeah. Yes? I think strategics often can ask the questions, and the tacticians can answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Ask the questions and ask the questions. It's very interesting. It's a really simple way of looking at it. I think you're right. No, no, no. It's, I mean, it's just a very streamlined way of thinking about it. I think that's fascinating. Who else? Okay. Well, these are all, these are all things that are, that are spoken about um, in the research and in the pundits' comments and observations about um, why it is that women contribute to financial results. Um, let me tell you about some of the comments that I've come across um, from the pundits about um, our styles and our contributions in the strategic context. Some of these you may believe, some of these you may not. Um, some of them you may have experienced, others you may reject. We foster, we women, foster better work environments for our employees. We li listen better and we offer more support. That's a pretty common theme. We're more likely to hold people accountable. I can certainly say this about myself. I have to restrain myself from holding people accountable, not in a negative way. But I, I have always valued very direct conversations from others to me about what I'm not doing right. And I probably learned the most from those really awkward conversations. And I'm usually eager to share that kind of feedback with people. <laughs> and rest restraint is the key. Um, so we're especially likely to hold CEOs accountable for poor stock performance. Um, and so it's typically the women board members who become almost strident on this theme. And, the literature plays out example after example of this. Some say employees behave better in front of us. Uh, instead of arguing, they tend to challenge each other in a more egalitarian way. Um, just sort of the rules of the road are um, a little gentler and that, that stimulates a, a positive work experience. We're very good for teamwork. That's what I, you know, you read it over and over again. Women foster teamwork. We encourage innovation. Now, I, I have seen this in a variety of studies, and I have to tell you that a few years ago, um, and I can't remember her name, this really remarkable woman um, from uh, New York State government, she's since gone into private uh, practice, but she was sponsoring a study of um, the largest legacy research labs in the country and how women had participated in innovation. And Kodak is one of those old labs, I mean, like Bell Labs and IBM, and um, we've had this really phenomenal research facility and really phenomenal results coming out of it for many, many decades. 
when she put up on the screen the number of patents issued to the company over, I think it was two decades, and the number of women who are named inventors on the patents, I was appalled. I'd never really thought about it that way. But a number of us in the room immediate la immediately launched a Women in Technology Initiative at Kodak to, again, focus on the feeder pool, the women that we were, that we were recruiting to the company, and making sure that they were placed in um, uh, in environments where they could not only be innovative, but bring those innovations to fore in the form of an a patent application which the company pursued. And we've, we've uh, markedly increased the number um, of women inventors in the company as a result. A larger proportion of us in management appear um, to balance the risk-taking be behavior of our male colleagues. Um, I'm not sure I really like that idea um, because I think women are often viewed um, as not being able to take risks not being comfortable with risk. And so the idea that we're sort of the great equalizers, I don't really like that, but that's something that people point to. We create a more diver diverse culture that favors the exploration of different business opportunities. I, I think that's pretty consistent with my, with my experience. Um, the greater the fraction of us on the board, the better is the attendance of male board directors. So I find that very interesting. <laughs> I find that very interesting. I guess they feel got to show up. We also have better uh, board attendance records overall, and that's a, by, a, by a substantial margin. So I, I guess women take their board, um, their board positions very seriously, as they should, since not many of us have them. There's a couple more fun facts to know and tell. I, I find, find it so interesting. U.S. and French companies with more women in management survived the 2008 financial crisis far better. Companies recording the largest declines had 75% or more male management. The French analyst um, in the study writes, feminization of management seems to protect against financial crisis. But he also poses an intriguing question about bull markets. Do feminized companies actually excel in a bull environment? And, I, and nobody, you know, that's, as far as I can tell, that's not been studied. But if we are less comfortable with, comfortable with risk, are we able to lead companies to take advantage of bull markets? That's really the question. Companies experiencing high visibility crises, and you can think about some of those that have been on the front pages, um, that result in the ouster of a senior executive, most often replace him with a woman. And that statistic is very pronounced and very interesting. Women are more supportive of other women in corporations that have greater female proportions. I don't think this will come as a surprise to many of you. Where female ranks are slim, women feel a greater need to outperform one another. And I, I can certainly say I've had this experience in my career. Um, I've had the great privilege to, to work for many really, really wonderful and supportive um, bosses. I had one boss in my career who was a woman who needed to be the only woman in the room. And it was clear. It was clear to all of us. So nothing that we, David, the famous <laughs> David Kurtz, good morning. How are you? I, I was showering you with compliments earlier, so you missed all of it, oh, and I won't please, repeat them. Please. No, no, no. Um, but anyway, so uh, it was a really uh, dysfunctional relationship for all the women that reported to her because we were never given credit and we were never brought into any significant uh, meetings or presentations. So um, I have experienced that myself, and I, I'm glad to know that as the ranks of women increase in companies, that behavior is, is drifting away. So this is what I believe in, about all of this, about why women contribute to financial performance. Um, in my own experience, I've seen the benefit time and time again, without a single exception, of diverse teams. Um, building gender diverse teams is definitely a, um, a path to success. I spoke earlier of being wedded to pro a project management approach, about building projects around the goals that um, I'm responsible for delivering on. The second approach that I subscribe to is brainstorming, and I feel very, very, um, uh, I'm very convicted about this. Um, before any strategy that I'm responsible for is set, I make sure that it's brainstormed and, deba and debated among a diverse set of thought leaders, um, really fully debated. I think that's something that probably frustrates David. This, th this way, the, the sort of the natural range of talents and perspectives from whomever they may come um, is incorporated into th the thinking about the path forward. So employing a disciplined work um, method like project management, um, structuring diverse teams, 
and trusting the perspectives of those teams enough to act on them, I think these are the building blocks um, for the aspiring strategic partner. Seven or eight years ago, the wife of Kodak's then general counsel convinced me to join her for a week at the Golden Door, and I don't know if any of you have had that experience. Um, it's a, a place in Escondido, California. This friend of mine had often talked reverently about her experiences there, and I couldn't imagine anything could be so great. But I finally went with her. The door was founded by a woman named Deborah Zeke, and um, many credit her with launching the modern day fitness and exercise um, movement, the fitness movement. I've gone back to the Golden Door almost every January since. I missed the January bankruptcy filing, unfortunately, which is why I've been so grumpy all year, David. Um, <laughs> I just go there to reflect on the year past and to plan the year ahead. Deborah is someone who's uh, always espoused a, a, a behavior of mindfulness, you know, being present in the moment, exercise, nutrition, and good organization. So she's a woman who is never without her planner. She's in her 90s now, but she's even on the, on the, tra on the uh, indoor track, she's always got her planner with her. But I really go there to just hear about what Deborah's thinking about. Um, she is one of the most brilliant, active, vibrant minds I know. She's had incredible, incredible life experiences. Um, among many of these, she ran unsuccessfully for Congress in 1982. But as so often seems the case in her life, um, that loss prompted a breakthrough. In the process of running, she discovered that there's no single resource um, for answering new House and Senate members' questions. How do I get started? How do I set up my office? Who do I hire? What am I supposed to be doing? When do I go to the floor? Nothing, no direction whatsoever. So she jumped in to fill the void. And she wrote the first management manual, manual for members of Congress. It's called Setting Course. And it remains the reference um, book for anybody coming to the Hill. It's now in its 11th or 12th edition. Um, and it greets every freshman legislator who makes his way onto the hill or her way onto the hill. It's sitting on their desk when they arrive. So I think of setting course as sort of the way that a strategic uh, partner um, should, uh, should lead. Um, setting the course is what strategy is all about. And Deborah is the personification of someone who has lived that ideal. In our remaining time together this morning, because I'd like to leave um, time for Q&A and just general dialogue, because I always find that's the richest part of any experience. Um, I'd like to talk about charting our own courses for increasing women's participation in strategy setting. And these are my suggestions. Some of these I shared with you at the networking event last night. We're living in what my British friends like to call the DIY age, do it yourself, self-help. You're fully responsible for rounding yourself out and for preparing yourselves for the roles of increasing scope and significance. Many companies, Kodak first among them, do not have the money these days to send us to endless training courses. Lots ha um, ha a lot of developments have been made in internal training um, opportunities, but the fact is we all remain responsible for taking charge and um, developing ourselves. Every woman in this room must learn finance. Right, David? Must learn finance, because in the end, numbers drive every important decision. You won't be taken seriously if you can't read a balance sheet or comfortably discuss a profit and loss statement. This doesn't mean that you have to get an MBA or you have to find a beneficent employer who will send you off to school. There are lots of ways to get this training by yourselves. Um, I did relate last night that I I don't know what I was thinking, but it, when I was in this, the law school, there was no combined program. So you just sort of went se sequentially through the law school and then you went to the MBA program at Weatherhead. But I decided to take a statistics course during second year, and it almost killed me. I mean, just, I, and I, I, but I regret, and I've regretted every day since that I didn't go on to get my MBA. And I feel so conscious about it. Um, what I've uh, been fortunate to have is great finance partners in most of the roles that I've um, served, and that's really critical for me. Um, but you do have to go out and get this training. The best way to do it, I found, is find a not-for-profit in your community, volunteer, and get yourself on the finance committee, and then just listen. And typically, boards in our communities are filled with folks who have retired who are experts in their fields. And I found 
many, many retired men who are willing to st sit down and explain to me what EBITDA means and that sort of thing. So um, to Colleen's point last night, she was talking about Googling that at one point in her career. So um, uh, it's really, really important that you do this. A second skill set that you must have is public speaking. And I don't hold myself out as an, any expert. And in fact, until a few years ago, I probably couldn't have gotten up here and talked to you. But there are many ways to do that. So get yourself out there, again, in your communities. Take leadership positions at your schools, at you know, wherever, and, and get comfortable getting in front of groups. There's a wonderful TED Talk. I don't know if any of you, I'm, I'm addicted to TED Talks, but it's a, it's a, it started out as a, a, a conference um, uh, thing, and now, it's, now there are all these TED Talks online. And there's a, a talk by Nancy Duarte, I think is her name, and she talks about how to deliver a great speech. And she um, patterns, she actually shows the patterns of Martin Luther King's speeches and Steve Jobs' product launches. Um, very similar in nature, a fascinating, fascinating speech. So look at that um, when you have time, if you haven't seen it. Um, there are a lot of lessons there. And then just get some experience. You don't have to do it at your employers. If, you're, you, know, if you feel self-conscious self about that, go out, volunteer at the law school, do, do things um, in your community that will help you gain the, the advantage. At some point every year, and this is to the women in the room, for at least a day, if not a week, stop multitasking and taking care of everybody around you and focus on planning your path upward. My thinking place, as I've said, is the golden door. It's, it's a true story. I've made comparatively little career progress in the years I haven't gone, so I'm still in bankruptcy and <laughs> I haven't moved anywhere since January 19th. That's the reason, and that's the reason why I'm grumpy. Go find your place and insist to yourself that you're going to avoid interruptions and you're going to focus on where you are and where you're going. You will feel so much more organized and so much more in control. I was in um, uh, Mumbai a, a couple of weeks ago now, and uh, we always do in these visits a women's forum. And um, there, it, this was a room full of incredible women, all of whom, as I understand, have a lot going on outside of the room and they're very worried about their jobs. And uh, one of the women talked about how difficult it was for her to convince her husband and children in a very traditional Indian family that she needed to take her own vacation so that she could sort through all of these things swirling around in her mind. But that after a couple of years of discussion with her family, they finally let her go. And she, she went away to her birthplace for three days and she entered some sort of a retreat and um, meditated. And she talked about this transformative experience and how it had set her thinking in a whole new way about her career, her family, her commitments to her community. It was really, really inspiring. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. So please do that for yourselves. It's incredibly, incredibly important. Be choiceful about who you work for. This is really important as well because we find ourselves in employment situations like mine where you, you, know, you just think, I'm never going to get out of this. I'm here for the rest of my life. It's the ball and chain around my ankle. That's not really how I feel about Kodak on well, some days. But um, it's a, no, it's a terrific place. But, but in the two, this, is, this is from the 2010 McKinsey report, and it's really hard to read, so I'm just going to describe it to you. Um, in that report, McKinsey described 13 key measures more commonly implemented by leaders of companies that are strongly committed to diversity, to gender diversity. Based on hundreds of CEO and top executive interviews and analysis of their company's gender composition and financial performance, McKinsey devised an ecosystem that's depicted here with the three circles of the top three measures having the greatest effect on women representation at the top. These are at the top visible management commitment or visible monitoring by the CEO and the top executive uh, team of the progress and gender diversity programs. Um, on the left, uh, skill building programs aimed specifically at women within the organization. And on the right, additional measures that McKinsey calls critical enablers. And some of, so an example of these are performance evaluation systems that neutralize the effect of parental leaves or flexible work schedules. Look for these sorts of things in the employers that you're signing up to spend a good part of your life with. Um, one thing I can say about Kodak, I think on the first day I joined Kodak, there was a women's forum meeting. Um, I just talked about those. So all these years later, we're still conducting them wherever, um, wherever in the world we find ourselves. This was a company that for decades was on the places we like to work list, um, best places to work for list. It, uh, Eric Holder was the chairman of our diversity committee um, 15 years ago. Uh, we had a diversity committee 15 years ago. 
the company has been incredibly, incredibly committed to diversity. The HR programs are a function of that commitment or a reflection of that commitment. And it's why people like me and some of my female colleagues have had opportunities in the company. This just didn't happen by accident. This was a company that planned for developing and advancing women to top positions. And, um, and the company has been better off for it. And I certainly have been, a, have been better off for that commitment. So look for that. Don't accept anything less. Don't join a company that doesn't have diversity on its agenda. Um, you really, again, you have to make your own way. And it's important that you do your own due diligence on your employer before you join a company or a firm or before you, before you move. I was particularly um, gratified to hear the remarks of our sponsor last night at the networking um, meeting, how committed he is to diversity and how excited he was about um, sponsoring this forum. And that's a guy that I'd love to work for. Um, and that's, that, that's, you have to do that kind of thinking when you're in the job market. Look for the right boss. If I'm working for a man, I'm hoping he has daughters who are entering the workforce. Um, that sounds trite, but it's played out pretty well in my career. Um, so you want to make sure, and I've talked about the, um, what my kids had a name for the boss that I described earlier. I can't remember what it was. It was very harsh. But um, <laughs> you know, you, it's, it, you're, you're in partnership with the people that manage you. And so you need to make sure that you align yourself with someone who sees your talents um, and who's willing to promote those talents and willing to put you in front of a crowd and give you, pro give you credit for the projects that you um, generate. So again, be very, very choiceful about who you're working for and, and who's around you. I talked about Bill Lee at, um, at Wilmer Hale and at Harvard. Um, Bill taught me a few years ago in a case that he was handling for us. It was our lawsuit against uh, LG and Samsung at the International Trade Committee Commission that there's a big difference between mentoring and sponsoring. And what Bill explained to me was that he and the firm had generated countless mentoring programs and had hooked up women with older partners, both male and female, to help them understand the dynamics of career advancement and that those had achieved some measure of success over the years. But he said, it wasn't until I started putting my money where my mouth was and opening doors for women that we really started to see change. So Bill, um, in, as an example, in our case, um, Kodak always, before we start a major litigation, we insist that the firm deliver to us a um, staffing plan that shows a diverse team on the case, um, both in terms of gender and minorities. And in this case, we had an outstanding associate who we'd always seen kind of in the, in the support role um, at the ITC. And so Bill came to us one day, and this was Beth the Company litigation, um, so it was, it was a very significant case. Um, he came to us and asked if Nina could uh, have her first argument in front of the ITC on our case. And we all said, oh my god, you know, and this, is, uh, this is kind of an awkward time to ask Bill because we have to have the best, only the best. But we, he convinced us that this was Nina's time, um, and she was spectacular. Um, she did two days of oral argument. Um, she was masterful, and she was made partner immediately afterwards, and we were all so gratified by that. Bill has done this over and over and over again at the firm, and so if any of you are thinking about moving law firms, I really think Wilmer Hale is a very progressive place. Um, he, he sponsors uh, forums for poor up for women um, on a quarterly basis at um, offices around the country and around the globe, and tries to personally attend, despite a very demanding trial schedule, almost all of those. Um, he, I have a friend at the firm who recently left um, on sabbatical to go to the public defender's office because she wanted to try that and Bill opened that door and made it happen for her and she'll be there for six months and then she'll come back to the firm. So, you know, firms are um, starting to, to do or starting continuing to do these kinds of things and again, if you're in the law firm environment looking for this kind of sponsorship um, more than merely mentoring I think is really, really key. Um, I have had that experience myself when, at Kodak when I said that I wanted to um, go into line management. Um, very quickly, our CEO, Antonio Perez, said, look, we've got a small business that's technology focused. You're working in technology. It was the organic light emitting diode um, business that Kodak had. Uh, we'd invented the technology and we had a small business. So go run it. We're probably going to sell it, but run it for a while and see what you think, which I did. Um, it, I don't know why he thought I could do that. I didn't have the training, but I went off and ran it with a very good team and a very strong finance partner in place. Um, and we did end, end up selling it to LG um, for quite a nice profit. So that was a very, uh, that was my launch into the business world and it was um, a risk he took on me and, and 
I hope that I return the favor in kind. Um, care and feeding. I've talked to you, care and feeding for us. I've talked to you about getting away and having time for yourself to think through your planning. Um, also critical to your long-term well-being is cultivating interest outside of your profession. So um, I think Dean Mitchell quoted Margaret Thatcher. Last Saturday, I attended a lecture by Barbara Walters at uh, my freshman daughter's college. Among other of her interview subjects, Ms. Walters related um, several conversations that she'd had with Margaret Thatcher, both while she was in office and then afterwards. And remember that she was the longest serving prime minister in uh, the United Kingdom's history. I don't know if you've seen Iron Lady. I found it a terribly depressing film, um, but, but very instructive. And I was particularly glad that I'd seen it before I heard what Ms. Walters had to say. Um, much like her portrayal in that movie, according to Ms. Walters, um, Baroness Thatcher obsessed in interviews over her ouster by her own um, conservative party. She took this as the highest form of betrayal. Um, she's told Ms. Walters that even today, 22 years after leaving office, um, she finds herself driving towards 10 Downing Street. And she finds herself in the middle of the night when the phone rings, racing to pick it up and thinking, what's the crisis that I need to issue a statement about first thing in the morning? Um, you saw this in the movie. The lesson that Ms. Walters derives from this and which she shared with us and which I wanted to pass on to you because I thought it was extraordinary is to be sure to have enough, enough in your life that when you're no longer the prime minister or the CEO or the dean of the law school or the managing partner uh, or the network news anchor, um, you have something to turn to, something that's significant enough that will keep your intellect active and your passions engaged. Um, I find that women fall short in this category. We don't, uh, we become so consumed with taking care of everyone and excelling in our professions that we don't um, we don't generally pursue our interests outside and we really need to. And the last thing I ask is please, please, and I think this Dean Mitchell has created a shining example here of, um, of what, what we all need to be doing. Please don't ever think twice about reaching out a hand and helping up another, another capable woman. With your guidance and support, she will never disappoint. She will always exceed expectations. So please make that part of your commitment to give back. I want to thank my co-chairs, particularly Anne, who I don't know why she didn't just throw up her hands and get frustrated months ago because Anne was always on the case and all of us were running away from the responsibility. So <laughs> she was an amazing project leader and an amazing strategist for this, for this conference and I thank her so much. Um, I want to really express sincere appreciation to our sponsors. This is a kind of a risky thing to take sponsorship of an inaugural event and particularly one that is focused on what this one is. So I, th I thank them very much. And, and Dean Mitchell, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. I'm really glad to be here. Um, questions, conversations, comments, dialogue, debates, thoughts? Yes. Oh, thank you. And, Good. Uh, tell her, as a, as a woman in the business, uh, business school, these are all very good practical suggestions that yeah. uh, she can take. Can take to heart. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And she can watch it on the webcam. They're going to have a case. Oh, yikes. <laughs> Did I know that, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I didn't talk about the bankruptcy. <laughs> Excuse me, we need everybody, if, they, if you have a question, if you could come up to the microphone so we can make sure we have the audio on our webcast. Oh, come on. It's only 9.45 in the morning. We have a whole day of this, and we need you guys to be actively engaged. Hi. Hi. Um, one of the things, you talked about suggestions, but what you didn't speak about, which I'm interested in, is your path and how you got to where you are, because I think what it sounded like that you had many different careers, uh, opportunities, influences, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about if you decided it, if it was accidental, if it was, you know, people that you met along the way, and just maybe some more on that. Thank you for asking that question. I, I have been really fortunate to have um, a number of really extraordinary mentors and sponsors. Um, I mentioned Willie Shee, who was one of them. 
Um, I, very early on at Kodak, I expressed this um, self uh, doubt around finance, and I was um, given the chance to leave legal and go work for the CEO or the CFO for um, two years. And he was a guy that had run the largest division at GE, and um, for Jack Walsh, and was sort of on his way towards the end of his career. Really wanted to teach, and he taught me everything he could, I, everything I was able to absorb about finance, and that really changed the sort of the course of my career because I was suddenly able to qualify for things outside of the legal role, which I enjoyed very much, but I always had, um, uh, uh, I, I was always interested in doing kind of line things. So that was a big, um, that was a tremendous uh, support. I, I married um, a wonderful man uh, many, many years ago who came from a very traditional Italian family, and I remember I worked at Bausch & Lomb um, after we finished traveling the country, and he completed his training, and I had left litigation. And I remember him dropping me off at the office at about 10 o'clock at night one night because we were working on an acquisition and the team was meeting to work through the night. And he said, you know, this isn't what I, um, I bought into when I married you. And I thought, oh, good Lord, this is it. This is the end of the marriage. You know, this is, he's finally coming out and telling me what he really thinks. And um, I have to say that was the last time he ever um, didn't completely support me. Um, he's, a, he's an amazing man, he's an entrepreneur, he's a surgeon, he has many businesses. We both watch, his family, watch over his family business. Um, but he has been there for me at every turn. And um, I know that sounds kind of corny, but without him and without his family support, I couldn't have uh, managed the conflicts that arise when your nanny quits. I, my, I was saying last night I was in India several years ago when I got a text from a nanny who was quitting right then. Um, you know, you need, a, you need a support network in those situations, and if you don't have it, um, and you, you look at work as if you're not reliable, you're not going to get the next job. So, so those are just a couple of things. Um, overall, I've just been very fortunate, and I think Case prepared me well to, um, to interact with people and socialize with people and um, you know, draw the best out of them, so I enjoy that. Other questions? This is a woman who started her own law firm, which I just was, I, I was amazed by, which still exists, which is an incredible legacy. This is for a really tall <laughs> <laughs> It is. So you started to touch on it, but I think one of the things that is a common theme both in, in, corporate, in the corporate world and in private law practice is the work-life balance. Yeah. And yeah. it's particularly hard on women because we tend to be the primary caregivers for our children, our mm -hmm. parents, That's our right. family. And can you speak a little bit to how you balance those two things? Sure. I think the greatest tool for me in balancing has been the BlackBerry. I remember back when we didn't have Blackberries. I'm not that I'm a fan of Blackberries, but but the device. Um, that really it's silly, but it changed my life. I mean it really enabled me to become ever present and ever connected. And that's a bad thing, but from a career advancement standpoint, it can be a really good thing. Um, balance uh, I think is best achieved by doing what Barbara Walters was talking about, which is to make sure that you've got something on the outside of your professional career that, is, that you can be as passionate about as you, you are your own career. Um, I'm, I'm not a poster child for that. Um, I, a few years ago, was working on a, um, on a licensed transaction with Samsung and was in Korea 18 times in the course of a calendar year. Um, my kids were pretty upset about that. So um, I will say, well, I'll say this now because I've said it in other, uh, to other audiences. I have, a, a, I have fantastic kids. My oldest daughter was anorexic. And, um, you know, this is a disease that we don't understand a lot about. It's an incredibly debilitating disease for the person who has it and for the family around her. And I blamed myself for the two and a half years that she was really lost to us. It was just a really terrible, terrible time. Um, I felt that it was a result of my not being home, of being on the road too much, of not being at every school musical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have a wonderful um, f uh, eating disorder program at the University of Rochester, and we were able to connect her with the, the chief of the program um, for those years. And he was a miracle worker. She was never hospitalized. She was a, in a very, very difficult shape when we presented her to the program. But she's, um, I, th I think of anorexia as a bit of, a bit like alcoholism. I think it's something that you always have with you. You don't really recover from it. Um, but she's been 
uh, eating disorder free for a number of years and lives a very healthy lifestyle now and is not, I, as far as I can tell, those demons are gone. Um, that's something that jolts you into reality. And during that time, what I learned was I had chosen an employer that chosen an employer that was willing to stand by me. I had a general counsel in Europe at the time who had two daughters in the throes of anorexia. And she and I found each other, and we, although we lived in different places, we were our support, the support network for each other. And Kodak's the kind of place that cultivates that. So I can't emphasize enough what I was saying earlier about being very thoughtful about the employer that you choose, the firm that you choose, the management that you work for, because there will be times in your life when you come across difficult trials like that. And if you don't have that support network around you, you won't get through it and still be advancing your career. So. I think we've run over, but yeah. This so is, um, there's, there's no better way to start a day of dialogue and conversation than listening to this amazing speaker. And thank you for sharing your story and your wisdom. And uh, it's, it's really important to all of us. Um, I was at a... Uh, luncheon honoring April Boyce last week, who's another one of the speakers that you'll hear from today. And as they were honoring April, they recited and shared an African-American proverb that really, to me, listening to Laura's presentation, um, <coughs> resonates. And it is, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And it just, it, you set the stage for, for that type of dialogue and that type of day. As we put together the program, and we were very mindful about having time to network and longer breaks than you might otherwise have at a conference. So we have a 15 minute break, which is now, by the way, a 10 minute break. <laughs> <laughs> so both you can check in with the office, but we also hope you'll take this time to introduce yourself to somebody you don't know, to meet a speaker, to continue the conversation throughout the break and all day today. So we'll see you back here at 10 o'clock.